Hi, everyone. It's not my pattern to hunt out the hot issues of the present moment and give my take, but I found this to be an interesting matter to think through, and I thought I would share with you my thinking. This is an issue that comes up on social media, especially, it seems to me, Twitter every few months, and I can see the reasons why it does. And the whole issue has to do with the question, did David, and we're talking about David in the Bible, uh, the chapters are Second Samuel chapters 11 and 12, did King David rape Bathsheba or was her sexual... I don't know if relationship is the right word, her sexual encounter with him. Was it consensual in some way? Now, I think that I understand something of the heated discussion around this issue. I think because in the world today, it touches a lot of controversial and heated subjects. Uh, those subjects and controversies are sexual abuse, not believing victims, ignoring sexual abuse, and perhaps blaming the woman who might be a victim in sexual abuse. But it also deals with controversy on the other side, or what some people would call the other side. Uh, that is controversy around false accusations of sexual abuse, or perhaps the claim to abuse where it may not actually have been there. So when you go back to 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, and you take a look at it from these different perspectives, Oftentimes, there's one side that says, how dare you minimize Bathsheba as a victim of sexual abuse? Of course, Bathsheba was raped. But then there's another side that says, how dare you falsely accuse a man, in this case, David, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, how dare you falsely accuse a man of sexual abuse when he really didn't do it? Now, as I've kind of surveyed, and I'll admit, I haven't done a deep dive into what different people's opinions are on this, because actually I'm more concerned with what the Bible says about it than with the different opinions. I mean, I, I have some interest in the varying opinions. But from what I have seen, many people seem very confident in their opinions on this issue. They come at it from perspectives that basically say, well, it's obvious that David raped Bathsheba, and then they go on to explain why. Or, it's obvious that David didn't rape Bathsheba. Instead, she seduced him, perhaps even. And they go on to explain why. Now, I think it's very important that we don't allow our passion for a contemporary issue to dominate our interpretation of the Bible or to blind us to what the Bible says. So somebody may be very passionate today for the issue of defending women against sexual abuse, or somebody may be very passionate about the issue of defending men against unjust or inaccurate accusation. Whichever side you're on, we shouldn't allow our passion for that contemporary issue to dominate the way we interpret the Bible. Or again, as I said, to blind us to what the Bible says. You see, in these issues, so often it's not what a person sees, it's what they close their eyes to in the text. That's the issue. But if we are concerned about sexual abuse against women, we can't decide to see something here in 2 Samuel 11 or to not see other things because it might help our cause. And if we are concerned about false accusations of sexual abuse, we can't decide to see something here in 2 Samuel 11 or to not see other things because that might help our cause. Now, let me say it plainly right here at the beginning. I'm not trying to leave some sort of suspenseful conclusion for the end. I don't believe that the evidence is conclusive either way. I don't believe that the account in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 gives us enough detail to make it obvious. Now, I do think that this is a good example of an opportunity to carefully look at the biblical account and to train ourselves in rightly dividing the word of truth. We can learn to carefully think about what the Bible does say and to not imagine that it says things that it does not.
And let me say this as well. I, I certainly don't expect this video to settle this issue. I've just simply done my best to think through it. But if you think that I've missed something, I very much welcome your comments to this video. I, I obviously don't think that I've seen everything that can possibly be seen. And so I don't think I'm going to comment on everything that can possibly comment on in this issue. But I, I feel that I've dealt with it as comprehensively, at least that I see right now at this moment. Now, before I get into the pro and con arguments of this, let's talk again about something foundational, about what the Bible says and the difference between what the Bible says and what the Bible infers. We should be firm in our thinking that there's a difference between what the Bible says and what one thinks the Bible infers or suggests. There's sometimes in biblical interpretation the idea that we put a lot of weight on something that the Bible does not directly say, but we think it infers or it at least suggests. And we need to be careful about that. So if you haven't done it lately, Right now is a good time to read the second Samuel chapter 11 and 12 passage and to think through it carefully. Matter of fact, I'm not going to be offended at all if you push the pause button right now. Go carefully read second Samuel 11 and 12. You might even want to read it out loud just so it, it is more implanted in your mind. Take your Bible, read through it and, and just get a sense of it again. And then what once doing that, I think you can see that nowhere in the text does it plainly say David raped Bathsheba or David forced himself upon Bathsheba. Again, I, I have read some of the arguments of people who say, well, it does say that. It's so clear. It's crystal clear. A again, I, I think there's some things that they're missing in the text there. Now, as well, nowhere in the text does it plainly say Bathsheba seduced David or Bathsheba consented to adultery with David. I don't think the scriptures speak with clarity either way. What we have are things that are suggested or inferred from the text. And in my mind, the biggest problem here, at least when it comes to the matter of biblical understanding here, the biggest problem here is that the inferences and the suggestions run both ways. I'm going to give you a list of reasons why I think the text could be understood to say that David did rape Bathsheba. And if that's all I gave to you, you'd walk away with one sense. But then again, I'm going to give you another list of reasons why I think the text suggests that David did not rape Bathsheba, that there was at least some sense in which the encounter was uh, uh, consensual. But again, I don't think that the evidence is exclusively on one side or another, and we need to appreciate that. You see, I can see in the text both reasons why someone might say, yes, David did rape Bathsheba, and reasons why someone might say, no, David did not rape Bathsheba. It was in some way a consensual relationship. So we want to look at the reasons on both sides and listen. My conclusion from looking at these reasons is that there's not enough evidence on either side to be uh, absolute in our determination. But honestly, that's up for you to decide, you before God and your own understanding of reading the Bible, your conscience. But I want you to think through these points as I present them here at all. So let's look at the reasons either way, or at least the reasons I could think of. And one more time, I want to say, if you think I've overlooked some reasons here, then please let me know. So let's walk through these together here. Some reasons to say, number one, yes, David did rape Bathsheba. Number one, I would say this, and let me just say, as I order these, these aren't in any particular order. I haven't necessarily ranked them strongest to weakest. I, I'm going to give you in this list the single reason I do think is the strongest reason, but you can think through that yourself and make your own determination about that. So number one, I would say in this list, is that David took her, took Bathsheba. That's what 2 Samuel chapter 11, 4 says. 
And that phrasing can mean coercion, such as with Shechem and Dinah in Genesis chapter 34, verse 2. This is the verse in 2 Samuel eleven four. Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now again, sometimes in the Bible, that phrasing is indicative of coercion in a sexual sense. And the example that you can look up for that is Genesis chapter 34, verse 2. That's one reason. Here's a second reason that the power differential between David as king and Bathsheba as both subject and woman meant that Bathsheba could not say no. And again, you, you kind of understand the logic. I, I don't you can decide for yourself whether or not you agree with it. But the logic is simply there. David is powerful. He has the whole apparatus of the government, of the royal throne behind him. He has soldiers and armies and bodyguards and power and wealth and prestige. He's the king, after all. And Bathsheba, being both a subject and a woman, the power differential was so great that the thinking goes that Bathsheba simply could not have said no that uh, consent meant nothing for her because she was unable to say no. And it's not really consent unless someone can say no. Here's a third reason why I can think of evidence why David did not rape Bathsheba. Number three, there was no word of rebuke from God or from Nathan the prophet spoken to Bathsheba. Well, that's very clear. I think that you noticed as you went through the passage there, taking a look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, that there simply is no rebuke made from Nathan the prophet or from the Lord speaking through him to Bathsheba. So there's no rebuke. There is, of course, a very strong rebuke given to David, King David, but no rebuke to Bathsheba. Then we come to number four. Uh, Nathan's parable in 2 Samuel chapter 12 represents Bathsheba as a lamb, and lambs are thought to be innocent, sacrificial victims. So when Nathan the prophet confronts David over his sin, he does it by telling a story, and the story is meant to kind of sneak the expose of sin in on David, because David, for the past year or so, uh, had been um, in denial of, of, of his sin. He was hiding it. He was not being honest with the kingdom or with God or with anybody else about it. So in that regard, uh, God wanted to use Nathan the prophet to bring the story to David, the, to bring the rebuke to David, the confrontation to him through a story. And the story is about a rich man who had a flock of many lambs and a poor man who had only one lamb And a visitor comes to uh, the rich man, and he's going to serve him a lamb dinner. And instead of taking one of the lambs from his own flock, he goes and he takes the lamb from the poor man's flock, who only has one lamb, and he goes and he serves that lamb for his daughter. And the idea is that a, a lamb, since it represents an innocent sacrificial victim, this is a reflection on Bathsheba's innocence. It wasn't a goat in the story. It was a lamb. Now, uh, as for the weight of that particular accusation or that particular point, it's not an accusation, uh, that particular piece of evidence, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that is a common mode of thinking uh, in this. So in the next uh, thing here, we have number five. In God's rebuke of David through the prophet Nathan, God promised that David's own wives would be violated by someone close to him. Now, I have to say, I think that this is the single strongest piece of evidence on the side of saying that David did rape Bathsheba, that it was completely non-consensual and it was a violation of Bathsheba in the sense of being non-consensual. It was a violation against her even if it was consensual. Uh, David was sinning against Bathsheba even if she completely you know, approved it, even if she initiated it with the text says she does not, but David still sinned against Bathsheba. But the way that God speaks to David, God's rebuke to him through Nathan, the prophet, God promised that David's own wives would be violated. And there's, if there's a, a correlation or a symmetry from this, you, you can see the point. 
Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 11 and 12 with me. It says this, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. And again, I would have to say, of all the sort of pieces of evidence that I'm bringing before you for the case that David did rape Bathsheba, I find this to be the single strongest one because uh, certainly in what happened later uh, when David's concubines were violated, uh, we see that fulfilled later on in the book of Second Samuel, th- that was completely non-consensual. And, and so if there's a symmetry there, that that's one part of the argument. Uh, Let me go to the next piece of evidence that David did rape Bathsheba. Number six, if David raped Bathsheba, it was not his biggest sin in the whole matter. A man who would murder is also capable of rape. In other words, nobody should say David did not rape Bathsheba because it would make him look bad to say that he raped Bathsheba. David did something far worse than sexual assault when he had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, murdered so that he could cover up uh, the sin that he committed against Bathsheba and against God. So if David did rape Bathsheba, it was not his greatest sin in this whole matter. He did far worse than that. And if somebody will sin in a worse way, then maybe they will also sin in a lesser way. And then number seven, which is uh, final on my list of evidence that David did rape Bathsheba. uh, Number seven would be this. Kings or other people in power can use their power coercively, and sometimes they do. Well, certainly this is true, right? This is just as evidence as it is that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, that people who have power uh, sometimes use their power coercively. So it would not be out of character for a king, especially a king of the ancient Near East, to do such a thing. Um, You might say that it was out of character for David. That's a separate argument. But just on principle, kings or other people in power can use their power coercively and sometimes they do. So look, what I presented to you right there are seven reasons that I can think to make an argument of the favor of the to make in favor of the argument that David did rape Bathsheba. And somebody might say, "Well, that settles it, David. Look, seven arguments. How can anybody protest against that? Look, there's seven things." Well, again, this is what I think leads to the complexity of this situation. We can't just look at a text and say, I'm going to look at and talk about and examine all the things that argue in my favor or how I want to see the text or how I think the text speaks. I also have to deal honestly, rightly, with the things that may argue against my position. So if you've come to this video thinking already, yes, absolutely, David did rape Bathsheba, well, I'm, I'm glad you listened to the seven reasons. If you think of some ones that I missed, fine. I'm happy for you to include them in the comments. Uh, but don't walk away. You need to hear the reasons that I'm going to give now following, reasons to say no, that David sinned by committing adultery with Bathsheba, but he did not rape her. You need to listen to those reasons as well. And I would say just the converse is true as well. If you came to this video, there, wow, there's no way that David raped Bathsheba. You need to listen through and carefully deal with those things that I mentioned, the seven things that I mentioned in the first section of this, uh, of this video, of this examination. So those are the seven reasons why I would say from the text, you could say that David did rape Bathsheba. Now, let's take a look at many reasons to say no, that David sinned by committing adultery, of course, but he did not rape Bathsheba. Okay, number one on this list, I would say, is there is no mention of Bathsheba's resistance or crying out, which is the standard for rape in the Mosaic law. You can find that in Deuteronomy chapter 22. And if a biblical author wanted to indicate rape, he he could simply very honestly or very straightforwardly declare it according to the formula for rape that's declared in the Mosaic law. 
So there being no mention of Bathsheba's resistance or crying out, that is relevant to the standard for rape. I mean, we just have to say that there is a standard case law, if you will, to discern whether or not uh, a sexual act was rape or was consensual given to us in the law of Moses. And according to that standard, this doesn't seem to fit it. So that, that that's number one. Uh, there's no mention of Bathsheba's resistance or crying out. Number two, I suggest to you that Bathsheba could have said no, even to a king. One can always say no, though it may cost dearly. Now, look, I understand the power differential argument, and surely that has some relevance to all this. But the Bible gives us some amazing situations where good and godly people said no. They said no to great powers. And to be clear, they paid a price. And we're not here to sit in judgment of somebody who refused to pay a price that will never be faced with paying. I understand that. But when we say that Bathsheba could not have said no, what we actually mean is it would have cost her dearly to say no, but she could have, at least theoretically. So I would say that that's a second reason to say that David did not rape Bathsheba, because at least in theory, and and again, theory and reality can be different, but at least in theory, Bathsheba could have said no, even to a king. It would have cost her, but she could have said it. Number three on my list for evidence that David did not rape Bathsheba is this. The author of 2 Samuel does not present this in the same way as the rape account of Tamar. You see, later on in 2 Samuel chapter 13, there is an occasion of rape. And it's just absolutely clear. It's very, just very definite there in the text of 2 Samuel chapter 13 that um, Amnon rapes, abs, uh, rapes, excuse me, Tamar, his sister, his half-sister. And it's just very clear in the text. So we know that the author of 2 Samuel, uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, they were one book in the Hebrew scriptures, we know that the author of those books or the editor, the compiler, however you want to describe it, they know how to present an account that speaks of rape. And they do not use that language of formulation here. So again, that's at least some piece of evidence here. A fourth piece of evidence in the argument that David did not rape Bathsheba can be found here. Took, as in 2 Samuel chapter 11, 4, doesn't always mean coercion as in Genesis chapter 24, verse 67, with Isaac and Rebekah. Now, we, we took a look on the side that would say, yes, David did rape Bathsheba. The, the idea that that word took in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 4, can definitely sometimes mean, or at least strongly imply, coercion in a sexual encounter. But the point is that it doesn't always mean that. And so the use of that word here isn't conclusive in that. We also see, and this is my fifth reason of, of evidence why David did not rape Bathsheba. Uh, the title for Psalm 51 uses a more neutral phrase describing sexual David's sexual contact with Bathsheba. It simply uses the more neutral phrase that he went into her. Again, it's not using the terminology of took, and it's certainly not using any more demonstrable uh terminology that would imply coercion or rape. It's just using a very neutral thing. And, and at least by implication, that at least implies or points ever so slightly, perhaps, into the direction of saying that it was consensual. Number six, the sixth piece of evidence that at least I could find or, or think of that David did not rape Bathsheba is here, that David had a great deal of power as king of Israel, but Bathsheba's beauty carried its own power as is true with good-looking, attractive men and women. Now look, there's no doubt, and it's important to say in this, that David had more power than Bathsheba. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And, and I'll leave it to you, the viewer, to discern how much weight that should have in this. I, I certainly don't think it should have zero weight, but I, I don't know if it should have all the weight in the discussion. But we shouldn't think that Bathsheba was without power. Her beauty, and she also had some status as being from somebody from one of the leading families in Israel. 
her grandfather was a counselor to the king. Her husband was a prestigious special forces soldier in David's armies and such. Now, again, it's important to say, and I'll let you determine for yourself how much weight to give this, but she did not have equal power to David, not at all, but they each had some semblance of power in themselves. Uh, Bathsheba was not a harlot. Uh, She was not someone who was, you know, uh, completely rejected and ignored in that society. She had at least some power to herself. Again, wanting to stress, not equal to David, but power on her own as well. Number seven in the uh, evidence that David did not rape Bathsheba is that David was the kind of man that many women are attracted to. He was successful. He was a warrior, a protector. He was wealthy, powerful, sensitive, creative, desired by others. Good heavens, David was even a musician. He was a popular musician. And again, it's very important to say that this does not mean that Bathsheba, this one specific woman, it does not mean that she was attracted to David. There's no way to tell from the text. All we can say is that in general, many women are attracted to the kind of man that David was. But that doesn't tell us anything because the text tells us nothing specifically that Bathsheba was attracted to David. All we can say was that in general, David was the kind of person that many people, many women are attracted to. Number eight in my list of evidence here that David did not rape Bathsheba is that David's driving impulse seems to be lust, not violence, at least according to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Now, again, uh, if somebody was building an argument only on something like this, I would be very uh, suspicious of it. You, you, you could call this a very small piece of evidence, but, but it's something in the text, at least. That there's the suggestion of David's lust in verses 2 and 3 of 2 Samuel 11, but there's no direct mention of violence in the text. Now, it's often said that rape isn't about lust, it's about violence. And here, the text itself points more to lust than to violence. Now, again, we have to insist that all we have to go on is the text that we have in front of us. There could have been outright violence and coercion that happened that the text does not tell us of. But we we just don't know. We don't know because the text does not mention it specifically. Let me go on to a ninth reason here of in the list of evidence that David did not rape Bathsheba. If power differential equals rape because of an inability to consent, then all of King David's sex with any of his wives was rape because no one can say no to the king. There is certainly something in this concept of a power differential. But I think if we put too much weight upon it, then we really do come to a situation where because David is the king and no one else in the kingdom is, including his wives, then it is impossible for David to have sex with even any of his wives or concubines, which was a shameful thing that David had, but that's another thing altogether. There's no possibility for David to have a sex with either his wives or his concubines without it being rape because of the power differential that exists between David and everybody else in the kingdom. So this this is a way of understanding the power differential argument as being not as compelling, uh, perhaps as first seen. Number 10 uh, in this, uh, Bathsheba possibly, I think it's important to emphasize possibly, Bathsheba possibly conspired with David in the cover-up. She didn't tell her husband Uriah when they later came together. Now, again, it isn't hard to postulate that, oh, well, she wanted to tell her husband, but she couldn't. She was prevented. But we just have to the text doesn't tell us that. The text is just silent to the idea that Bathsheba informed her husband at all. Uriah leaves his home, actually, if you want to be more technical, he leaves his porch, having not even actually gone into his home. He leaves his porch without having any word from his wife 
about what David did. And again, that at least raises a possibility. You might say it's an insignificant possibility, but I would say it's at least some possibility that Bathsheba conspired with David in the cover-up. Uh, because once again, she did not tell her husband Uriah when they at least came in close proximity. Uh, you know, e- e- even if you could say that they never saw each other face to face, they could have spoken through a wall. And again, it, this is conjectural, but th- this is what people are doing. The, w- the text doesn't speak clearly this issue one way or another. So we're drawing inferences and I'm just drawing the inferences on one side and now the inferences on another side. Uh, here's number 11 in that list of inferences or evidence that David did not rape Bathsheba. Number 11, Nathan's analogy was never intended to match the sin in every detail. David did not kill and eat Bathsheba as with the lamb. There's no figure of the traveler entertained in this story or how it worked out. The first and main specific sin rebuked in 2 Samuel chapter 12 is murder and not rape. So I, I think that there is some weakness in putting too much weight on the figure of the lamb in Nathan's parable in 2 Samuel chapter 12, because there's too many details in there that don't correspond to the situation. I, I, it's just not meant to bring out every detail. Matter of fact, I'll give sort of a related thing. Let, let's take a look first at God's word to David here, and then I'll make a related point here for number 12. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, this was God's word to David through the prophet, Sam, uh, prophet Nathan. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Okay, so that's God's word to David. That's the rebuke after the story plays out and David commands a death sentence for the man who did the thing in the story. And then Nathan gives that dramatic thing. You can't get away from the beautiful phrasing of this in the King James Version. Thou art the man. Um, and then that that's the, the result of it there in the verses I just read to you, verses eight and nine. Um, but let, let's take a look here. The point, and this is my uh, piece of evidence number 12, that David did not rape Bathsheba. The point of Nathan's parable was that David, with great selfishness, great disregard for his neighbor, and refusal to be content with what God had already gave him, took something, actually someone, that did not belong to him. Whether or not David used coercion towards the lamb in the story isn't relevant. Whether or not David was willing, it was wrong for David to take her. Her willingness would not justify the taking in the slightest. Again, I just think that's very important to understand. In the parable that Nathan gave, the the whole story isn't about using coercion against the lamb. It's taking what belonged, at least some sense, to the other man. So, in Nathan's parable, the victim isn't really Bathsheba fundamentally. The victim is Uriah. He's the man with the single lamb. And that's why this is related to my uh, point number 13. In Nathan's parable, the wronged party, the poor man with one lamb, answers to Uriah, not Bathsheba. It wasn't wrong for the rich man in the parable to kill and eat a lamb. That's what they were there for. But it was wrong for the rich man in the parable to kill and eat the lamb of the poor man who had only one lamb. The lamb was not the victim or the wronged party in Nathan's parable. Again, I just think that's an important thing to to keep in mind here, especially if someone wants to put a lot of weight on the lamminess of Bathsheba as being represented. I, I think it's kind of missing the whole point of the parable. Okay, going on next to uh, reason number 14, why I think David did not rape Bathsheba. Uh, Number 14, Bathsheba also suffered terrible consequences from all this, the loss of her husband and the loss of the baby who was also her son. Again, we need to be very careful to say it, as we said this in the, the first part of it, the reasons why someone might say Bathsheba was raped. 
is there is no word of rebuke or condemnation, but there is terrible consequences. And someone could rightly say, I, I can imagine an answer back to this. Well, well, look, of, of course, victims of sexual abuse suffer consequences all the time that aren't their own. And, and that's true. But it, it's just pointing out here that Bathsheba did suffer terrible consequences in this, even though she was not rebuked or made guilty of sin. Um, we need to be very careful with this. It's always a problem to look at such things, such as what Bathsheba suffered in the loss of her husband and the loss of her child. It's always a problem to look at such things from the outside and say, well, this is God's correction or this is God's discipline. We need to be very careful here. But at the very least, we can say that Bathsheba shared in the consequences of the sin. Um, and that seems to be clear, at least somewhat from the text. Uh, number 15, evidence that David not raped Bathsheba. We see that Bathsheba's later status in the kingdom seems to imply a privileged and honor place, not normally matching with a relationship that began and one would have to say continued in rape. I mean, let, let's face it. Uh, if David raped Bathsheba and then married her against her will, against her desire, no consent there at all, and then continued to have sexual relations with her, which we know that he did because she uh, was the mother to another child from David, Solomon, then the whole relationship would have not only began in rape, but at least in some sense continued in that atmosphere of sexual abuse. That doesn't quite seem to be congruous, doesn't seem quite to match with Bathsheba's latest status in the kingdom. Again, we, we wouldn't say that's impossible, uh, but it, we're just looking at what things match with most naturally. And then number 16, and this is my final piece of evidence that David did not rape Bathsheba. Women and those considered to be beautiful can use their power seductively. Now again, th does that mean that Bathsheba used her power seductively? Well, the text doesn't say, not in my mind. But just as much as it's possible for a king to use his power inappropriately, it is possible for women uh, who are beautiful to use their power, so to speak, inappropriately or seductively. Now, in all of this, after presenting reasons why I think you could argue that David did rape Bathsheba, reasons why you could argue that David did not rape Bathsheba. At the end of it all, my assessment of this is we don't really know because the scriptures don't tell us. I'd like to bring before you a quote from an old Puritan commentator that I'd like to read, John Trapp. He said, where the scripture hath no tongue, we must have no ears. That was John Trapp commenting on Luke chapter 2, verse 42. And um, I agree with John Trapp on that. We just have to be good. I, I am very comfortable with saying, did David rape Bathsheba? We can't know. And look, we, we understand that we have a tendency to focus on the things in the text that support our position. And we have a tendency, which may even be worse, to ignore the things in the text that go against our possession, position. That isn't good or it isn't honest dealing with the Bible. We need to be honest when the evidence in the Bible is mixed. Now, I want to be careful here. Throughout the Bible, I, I find many occasions where people claim that the evidence is mixed when really I find it to be overwhelmingly on one side. So I don't agree with every claim to mixed evidence. But certainly I would say, some claims to mix evidence are spot on and true. And I want to say this, and this is very important. I, I hope if you've listened to the video thus far, you are listening still to this point. Just because I could think of more reasons why David did not rape Bathsheba, than I could think of reasons why he did rape her. I think the count was 16 to 7. That does not settle the issue. We really don't know. I think that there's enough mixed evidence, not just relying on a numerical count. That's a very, that, that's not a very discerning way to approach the subject. 
I think that the evidence is mixed enough to where we would say we don't really know. And I think that we should be cautious with people who act as if it is completely obvious one way or another. You see, whether or not David raped Bathsheba is not of ultimate importance to our understanding of the story. It's not of ultimate importance to us in the story. Now, I want to be careful here because certainly it was important for Bathsheba whether or not she was raped. And we don't want to minimize that. Whether or not she was raped mattered everything to her. But for us, it's not a key part of the story. And we make a mistake if we think that it is the key part of the story. If it was the key part of the story, God would have made it clear. And that's why I'm very comfortable with simply saying, we can't say definitely. There's some evidence to say that David did rape Bathsheba. There's other evidence to say that he did not rape Bathsheba. The scriptures aren't clear. Now, no matter what way you take this, and I would say this especially to those who kind of come on the side to say that uh, David did not rape Bathsheba, you should know that no one should think that David was innocent. Even if David was innocent of rape here, he certainly was not innocent of adultery. He was not innocent of seduction. He was not innocent of murder. He was not innocent of a terrible cover-up. Nobody should suggest for a moment that David was innocent. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he was guilty of rape. And as well, if David did not rape Bathsheba, it does not mean that they were equally responsible. It simply means that they were both responsible. I think any way you would slice this, even if you were to say that at least in some measure, this relationship was consensual on Bathsheba's side, David would have considerably more guilt than Bathsheba. She may still have guilt, but if you argue it from that side, but if she does, it's certainly lesser guilt. But here's what I find wonderful in this. We find redemption in this story either way. If it is true that David raped Bathsheba, then there's redemption for Bathsheba in this story. There's redemption for Bathsheba in the nobility in which the biblical account presents her and her later status of prestige and influence in the kingdom. She's not left as an abused, victimized woman. She rises to a position of power and prestige. She became the favored woman in the kingdom, and her place in the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah endures. She, she is not a beaten down, um, victimized woman in the final story of the scriptures. Not at all. She's a powerful, uh, favored woman. But I would say that there's also redemption for David in the story, if it is true that David raped Bathsheba. And the redemption for David is simply this, that though he terribly sinned, God still forgave and restored him. And God used him as an inspired author of some of the most precious parts of our Bible. That's a story of restoration as well. So if it is true that David did rape Bathsheba, there is a strong note of redemption in this. But if David did not rape Bathsheba and she was consenting or complicit in some way, then we still see wonderful redemption in God forgiving the both of them and even forgetting, forgiving, I should say, David of his far greater guilt. We see that in this dark chapter that it's not the end of the story for either Bathsheba or David. Now, we see redemption in the story either way you would take it. But when we look both at what is plainly said in these passages and in what is inferred or suggested, I think that we have evidence, so to speak, for either side of the issue. I don't think it can be settled conclusively. What is plain is this. David sinned 
terribly. That's the whole point of the passage. The point of the passage is never to focus on Bathsheba's sin. David sinned terribly, but he also repented deeply and sincerely. Dear, think about this, dear friend. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. That's what 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1 calls him. The sweet psalmist of Israel. The man who authored so many amazing psalms and who was Israel's greatest earthly king. That man was a sinner. He was a backslider and a brigand bordering on treason. You can find that in 1 Samuel chapter 27 and chapter 29. And in this situation that we find in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, in this situation with Bathsheba, David was in the very least an adulterer. And certainly he was the one who arranged the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. Yet God used this man remarkably and even after his death, idealized him as Israel's greatest earthly king. Even Jesus the Messiah would be called by the title, the Son of David. You see, out of all the ancestors of Jesus Christ and glorious ancestors, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I could go on, Judah, after all those, well, Judah wasn't such a glorious ancestor, but you get what I mean. Out of all the ancestors of Jesus Christ, God chose to identify Jesus most closely with David, the son of Jesse. This speaks to God's powerful redemption and to the great contrast there is between David with all of his terrible sins and Jesus with all of his perfection. Well, friends, those are my thoughts. I welcome any thoughts you have. Feel free to leave them in the comments. I can't promise that I'm going to respond to every comment, but I can try. And that's my take on this whole issue of whether or not in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, whether or not it could be said that David did rape Bathsheba or whether he did not rape Bathsheba. Those are my thoughts. I welcome yours in response.